Thank you so much for coming. It means a lot to me and to these heroes over here, <clears throat> including the wives, <laughs> including the wives and two daughters of one atomic veteran. One made it over here in the corner tonight, Rachel. And before I start, <clears throat> every one of them are staying in my home. I opened my doors to them. Uh, a couple of them won't be staying there overnight. They have their own places, relatives in the area, but they're all from out of town. And I, I'm elated to have them here. I just can't believe it. And um, I'll get started. I wanna thank Cindy Waters back there for contacting me about this uh, compelling program and thank her so much from all of us. And there's no better place to speak, no greater place to speak than the um, Manchester community, as I call it, Lecture Hall campus, right here. We're just so lucky to have this grand library. So many cities are losing their libraries. This library is the size of a li library for a large city. It's, it's incredible. And I want to thank the government agent in the audience for um, looking at us tonight. <clears throat> Last fall, a former great friend said to me twice, Gary, people don't care about you being a veteran. And they don't care about atomic veterans. Here's what I did. You're part of it. That was said to me because that person knew I was doing a documentary interviewing these atomic veterans over the years. If they had any cancers at all, what they did, what they were told to do or not to do or anything, what they wore, witnessing these um, atomic and hydrogen bomb weapons. So from that drastic cone, if that's how you pronounce K-O-A-N comment, I turned this evening in from that comment and invited Dr. Ken Ford, a very good friend of mine, he's gonna be 92, his wife, two atomic veterans, Hank Bolden and Ed Cohn, I don't mean to point, and his, their wives and his daughter. So that's what I did with that comment. I don't care what anyone thinks about me as, as a veteran, but you don't criticize the atomic veterans, and I'll tell you how I got involved um, with that. <clears throat> this is the first time anywhere ever we have had a scientist, one of the many scientists who worked on the hydrogen bomb, to come to a talk with two, I call them victims, of radiation poisoning, hence cancers, over the years. First time ever. When I was at hearings in Congress, we, didn't, we never had the scientists the same day as atomic veterans, not because it would be a problem, but we, they, they just uh, weren't brought in on those days. Then we had the liars from the government, and I'll have a letter up soon, um, the government trying to pull the wool over our eyes, but my senator I worked for, Senator Alan Cranston, was incredible. He would ask for a document, and when he did, it was, it was like it was like a subpoena, and we got all the papers. And what I did was I went, I got a job on the U.S. Senate Committee of Veterans Affairs in 1979. I had the military out of the way, sort of speaking. I had undergrad and grad school all the way. I'm a former intern, a page, and a Senate worker in Washington, D.C., but I grew up in the Adirondacks in New York State. And 
And um, I landed this job, I don't know how, on the committee. And my first day there, I was entry level. And across my desk, I read letters from veterans. That was 1979 to 81, telling us, pleading, they need health care. The VA won't recognize them, and rightly so that they were coming down with different types of cancer, scalp cancer, urinary tract, you name it. They were being denied health care by the VA. Our committee with the House side made the legislation and passed it for the VA to follow. It was called Title Code 38. So as I said earlier, rightly so, the VA turned them down for health care. It took the committee, long after I left and other people, eight years to get the first ailments compensated, related for VA health care. We lost many atomic veterans over the years prior to 1979, 80 to 88 that never got health care because it was a confidential to secret to top secret experiments in Nevada, a little bit of Arizona, New Mexico, the um, atolls on the South Pacific. And we'll, we'll talk quickly later. I have two gentlemen here that did cleanup in the late 70s, early 80s. Cleanup of the atomic waste and of, I worked on this, Agent Orange that was left over from Vietnam was taken to these islands and a place in the United States and just thrown in the ground with the radiation. And I have government reports on that. I copied everything. Nothing got by my desk. I didn't take anything. I just went around the corner when no one was looking and copied all these documents. <clears throat> Mainly, most of them were for, from veterans. I was shocked. I was shocked about the atomic veterans. At the same time, we were working on the Agent Orange, which I worked directly on. I call it the Agent Orange Discovery in Congress. And, and then also um, across my desk, it has nothing to do with tonight, the LSD that were given our soldiers. And what happened? I have the final reports on that. Nothing got by me. And uh, I'll never, I put it away for 33 years and finally took it out and I was shocked again, all that I had. Channel 3 came down just like that to my home. That was two and a half years ago. And I decided to do a documentary going around and, and interviewing these, these wonderful, um, well, as many people have said, heroes. And I've got heroes, as I said earlier, in my house, in my house courageous, and a daughter, as I said. Uh, I, I jumped around here a little bit, but uh, the U.S. government, under the Department of Defense and the Nuclear, Defense Nuclear Agency, for short, DNA, used our soldiers as guinea pigs and participants in the atomic and the hydrogen weapons testing, both in the U.S. and in the Marshall Islands, the atolls, they call them. How the government started this, in 1939, oh, I forgot to ask you the correct uh, pronunciation, two scientists, Leo Cesard, Cesard. Cesard <laughs> and um, Enrico Fermi, Rudolf had an idea. They wanted to write a letter to President Roosevelt about this new tremendous, uh, powerful, and large quantity of energy, new radium-like elements that could generate incredible power. Basically, I'm jumping around. But they thought the letter would be pushed away. There were, they were unknown at the time. So they got a hold of Alfred. Who knows who I'm talking about? Einstein. Einstein. Alfred liked the idea at the time. So Alfred signed the letter that, here it is here, it's hard to read, that, that went to um, 
President Roosevelt, and he was the only one that signed it. So it wouldn't be noticed. Okay, I gotta move along. That was 1939. By 1940, 41, we had the Manhattan Project, a top, top, top secret project went forward. We were worried about the Germans getting to the atomic bomb before we did. Now this is before we dropped it on uh, Japan, uh, I believe, yeah. And so it, it, it came about, and Saturday I had a phone call from a chemical engineer that put together part, he was a chemical engineer, not, a, not really a scientist, for the, for the Army. Um, Ralph Gates, he's gonna be 93, he couldn't make it, he's not doing that well. He melted TNT to go in the lenses of the bomb for Nagasaki. And they had one or two backup bombs in case Japan did not surrender. So he couldn't make it. And that's the atomic bomb, which is fission. Ken will get into the, to the um, hydrogen bomb, which is thermal nuclear, which is incredible heat, using fission to um, fusion. He'll handle that. I probably messed it up. Um, I, I, I just can't believe, you know, he, he's here. So by then, many of the soldiers were coming down with different types of cancers. I'll never forget it. We had phone calls coming into our office at the U.S. Senate office building, and they were crying. Veterans and their wives were crying. This is the late 70s, early 80s. Help us. We don't have money. We can't get treatment. This is, still was unknown. To the uh, to the VA and to many of us, even to myself, at that at that time. So over the years, we have had several ailments, if you will, that are covered now under atomic veterans. However, there's a problem. Atomic veterans have the burden of proof, not the VA or the government. That's a big mother. Burden of proof. Hank will get into that soon. Uh, that's incredible. At least with the Agent Orange folks, most of them are presumed to be, uh, if you're in Vietnam or just outside of Vietnam nowadays, you are presumed to be um, affected by the effects of Agent Orange. And um, th that, uh, that, that was an incredible time on the committee. I will back up one second. The other letter, uh, Bernie Sanders was head of the Veterans Committee for almost two years. He did a great job, but unfortunately, uh, the U.S. Senate went Republican uh, two years ago about, and he lost the uh, chairmanship, but he's still on the committee, and I've, I've worked a little bit with him. He sent his main um, staff person, who would have been my boss years ago, to my house with an aide and to go over all my papers and, and, and things like that. They were surprised. All the papers in Congress went digital uh, in 2011. I have, I have the hard copies. At, at home, and we'll go back, go forward, and there's Einstein. Now, um, Peter Welch, okay, I'm gonna move on. We got this, I gotta move it, I'm taking too much time. We got this letter from a veteran, atomic veteran. God, love him, thank God, the military gave him proof that he was there, he's long dead. John Nichols, US Navy. Look at this, folks, proof, bikini. Terry? Okay. And so that proved he was there. Now there's another part if I want to move along. And that's part of it. And um, uh, where is, uh, I don't see that admiral here, but these are the major generals, brigadier, rear admirals that I believe, Ken and I believe that they're the ones that started using our veterans, excuse me, our, our soldiers as guinea pigs and um, participants, guinea pigs, totally. No question about it. Not all, not all soldiers got radiation poisoning. Some only got very little, some got quite a bit. And we'll move along. Um, here is Defense Nuclear Agency. I copied and I blew my top. The second paragraph to the end, um, when it says 90%, uh, 
No, the last paragraph, it is generally assumed by scientists. This is the government talking, and you know, hey, they're not even thinking about you. Scientists, that even low levels of exposure carry some slight risk. Oh, what an understatement. For example, da 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 da. That blew our minds. Um, and I have more, more of those at home. And let's see, what's my next one? Then this is a, a hearing we had. You see how I out, um, outlined it up there? Uh, about the bikini and uh, patrol. And it's just more a castle, right? It's just more bullshit. Senator didn't like that. He, guys, he went, and gals, he went for it. Senator Alan Prince of California, long gone. Okay, I guess it's time. I, 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 took, I took too long. Uh, this is Ken's book. I'm, he's going to be here in a, a couple seconds, right here. I bought this right here in Manchester. It came out a year and a half ago. And I will say, the government <clears throat> tried to stop his book from being published <laughs> under the Department of Energy. Did that happen? No. Look what I got. Look what I got. And there's about 35 pages in here. Thank you. That'll give you a headache. It's, it's so detailed. So a great friend of mine, Dr. Kenneth Ford, come on up and take over. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, how's the audibility in the rest of the room? Good. Should I stay close to the mic here? I'm very pleased to be still at large and very, <laughs> and very pleased to be with you here in Manchester. Communicating with Gary over the last couple of years has been a very interesting, instructive, and pleasurable experience, and it's a real pleasure to be here now. I am going to be somewhat autobiographical. I am a veteran, uh, served two years in the Navy right at the end of World War II, uh, but I did not see combat and never, and never saw a bomb. So the, the testimony of the two vets over here will be much more significant than mine regarding the effects of nuclear weapons. My role came a little bit later, 1950 to 52, when I was part of the design team uh, that created the first hydrogen bomb. And uh, the bomb that was tested in 1952. Uh, the idea of using guinea pig soldiers had not yet occurred, but it, did, it didn't occur much later. It, it was in the 1950s. Uh, I had no role in that at all. I'm only an observer. I'll tell you a little bit about my, the role I did have uh, in, in, in helping to design the bomb. By the way, it was designed almost entirely by theoretical physicists, believe it or not. Uh, eventually, of course, there had to be metallurgists and chemists and engineers to make a bomb a reality, but the early design phase that led to the idea of what it should look like, how big it should be, and how it should be ignited that was really the work of a relatively small group of theoretical physicists. I then want to tell you a little bit about my, my, my own change of heart, uh, my attitude toward nuclear weapons that occurred later, and uh, th thinking about that more as a concerned citizen than as a scientist. And uh, well, at the end, we'll show you a letter I wrote to the New York Times, which I think may have precipitated this invitation. Uh, in 1950, when I was 24 years old, I, got, I just had that on. Back up a few spots. Back up a few spots, please. Uh, yeah. I thought you wanted your letter. You can believe I was 25 when this take was taken, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> As Gary said, 91 now. Uh, uh, my uh, professor at Princeton, I was graduate student. I just completed two years of graduate work. Uh, my professor, John Wheeler, uh, had decided it was his patriotic duty to take a leave of absence and go to Los Alamos to uh, work with a group trying to design the ace bomb. At that time, we didn't know whether it could be done or not, so it was a challenge. It turned out that very few senior scientists were willing to, uh, to join the project. They felt that they had done their bit in World War II and they wanted to remain with their students and their research and their teaching. Oh, okay. How's <laughs> Is that better? Uh, so Wheeler was one of the few motivated by a, a combination of patriotism and a fear of the uh, Soviet Union agreed to join the project and go to Los Alamos and work on the, on, on the uh, 
design team. He invited me and one other graduate student to join him, so I had to make that uh, big uh, decision at the time, whether to interrupt my graduate work or whether to work on weapons. I did decide to go, and I, my motivation was, in a way, very simple. It was simply the feeling that the world would be a safer place if the United States acquired a hydrogen bomb before the Soviet Union did. Recall that in the fall of 1949, only about six months earlier, uh, the Soviet Union had set off its first atomic explosion, sooner than many people expected. And that led to a, uh, a heightened anti-communist fervor in this country, to a heightened fear of the Soviet Union, to a heightened fear of a possible nuclear war, and to a heightened fear that the Soviet Union would move on from a fission bomb to design an H bomb, which then provided a, a rationale, a reason for us in the United States to work hard on, on to designing an H bomb. Uh, we, well, very briefly, I spent a year almost, almost 50 51. Then, uh, as uh, an auxiliary a project called Project Matterhorn moved from Los Alamos to Princeton. So I moved back to Princeton, but it's still in a 100% role as a bomb designer and had the privilege of using some of the very primitive, but at that time, out, uh, remarkable computers. Uh, well, I would say they're the best computer in the world we were able to use in our final calculation. And uh, it, it, it had, uh, for those of you who know megabytes, I'll tell you, it had three kilobytes of memory. <laughs> not megabytes, not gigabytes, three kilobytes. And one, me and one megahertz clock speed. But to us, it was a marvelous device. And we were able to use it to make a prediction of what the yield would be of that first uh, bomb. A prediction was seven megatons. It turned out to be 10, so we weren't so far off. Uh, if we could look at leave the young Ken Ford behind and look at the next picture. <clears throat> this is a picture taken on the island of the Aluja Lab in Anawetok Atoll. It, it, it is the, uh, it's called the mic device. It's the, it's the first hydrogen bomb, not yet with its atomic bomb trigger, sitting on top of this cylinder, which is 20 feet high and seven feet across, uh, would be, uh, a, new, a fission bomb, which would then provide the, the trigger to set off the uh, thermonuclear explosion. And just to remind you what 10 megatons is, 10 megatons is 700 Hiroshima's. Well, this device you're looking at released an amount of energy 700 times more than was enough to destroy a city in Japan. Since then, a few even more potent hydrogen bombs have been designed and exploded, although the trend in recent years has been towards smaller bombs, mainly to reduce their size and their weight, uh, but concomitant of that smaller size and smaller weight is that also smaller yield. So an incredibly large yield relative to uh, ordinary explosion is still even large compared to Hiroshima, but less, less than this. The next uh, slide here shows what happened when that exploded. <coughs> There's 10 megatons. Uh, picture taken from about 30 miles away. At that time, there were as yet nobody deliberately exposed to radiation. There may have been a little bit of radiation uh, inadvertently of uh, landing on the people who were 30 miles away, the observers. I was not one of them, by the way. I was still back in Princeton, so I had to wait a while to learn that the results were indeed successful. Uh, jumping ahead in time, I didn't work again on weapons. I went back myself to uh, uh, research, teaching, writing, and uh, but I, I I still kept in touch with many of my fellow scientists who had worked on the bomb. And my change of heart regarding the whole nuclear enterprise really came in in uh, the 1960s because I became an opponent of the Vietnam War and I began to develop the feeling that this country was, after all not so much more moral, not so much more to be trusted in international affairs or trusted with weapons of great power. I don't think it's maybe less of a patriot, less of a feeling of being proud to be an American, but it made me feel that our country was, after all, not so special, not so unique 
So the feeling I had when I first joined the project and helped to design that first bomb was our country was one that could be trusted with weapons of incredible power. I began to lose that trust around this time. So I made a declaration then that I would not do any more secret work or, or any more weapons work. Um, many, let's go on to the next, the next slide, which is my fourth and last of these remarks. <laughs> Following that successful test, uh, and in a week I took the hat all, I just showed you the so-called mic device with 10 megatons of yield. There were numerous, I mean numerous, hundreds, hundreds of tests, uh, nuclear test uh, explosions, many of them smaller, many of them conventional atomic bombs, a few of them uh, hydrogen bombs. The one that gained a good deal of notoriety and for good reason came two years after the one I was involved in. That was called Castle Bravo, 1954, at Bikini Atoll. Uh, that, for reasons, <laughs> The physicists involved made a serious mistake. They, under, they, they failed to take into account a particular nuclear process that could generate a lot of energy. As a result, they predicted, again, about seven or eight megatons as a yield, which turned out to be 15. So they were you know, twice, it was twice explosive power, and they now know why. Our original estimate of why we were a little under in our estimate, I think was only calculational error, the approximations we had to make, the uncertainties involved in the theory. In this case, the, uh, the reason for missing by a factor of two was clearly a mistake that had been made in not, not taking into account some of the uh, relevant energy producing effects. And before long, of course, conducting a test in the Pacific is very expensive in manpower and dollars. And there was a natural urge to uh, desire to try to make perform tests in the United States, continental United States. I've, I've remarked to some European friends, imagine if somebody said, well, could we find a place in Europe where we could test bombs above ground? It would have been a ridiculous question. There would be no place. But America was still, still had some big open spaces. And indeed, they found such a place in Nevada, the Nevada test site. This is a picture taken years later. And the reason I'm showing it is it's indicative of the, the large number of tests that were conducted there. Oops. Sorry. Could we back up to that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Some of what you see in this uh, test site are spots where bombs were exploded above ground. Some are places where they were exploded below ground, but with such force that they created little mounds or hillocks, uh, left their mark on the surface. And it's here where many, many um, uh, uh, soldiers and marines, perhaps some sailors, I'm not sure, uh, were exposed to radiation. We'll hear more about that uh, in a moment. I will uh, I'll just end, end my remarks by coming up to date in February of this year. Over the years, I increasingly believed that nuclear weapons were, were not only immoral, not only dangerous, but, but uh, totally undesirable. The correct number of weapons in the world should be zero, not, not uh, any, any number larger than that. And indeed, President Obama and other world leaders have over the years advocated moving towards zero nuclear weapons, toward total nuclear disarmament. But it's, it's happening very, very slowly. It won't happen in my lifetime. I hope it happens in the lifetime of my children or grandchildren. Uh, so I'll finish just by reading a letter. I wrote the New York Times, which may have had some, something to do with uh, my invitation here tonight. You know, the thing about talking about the, the size of the weapon, megatons, kilotons, one has to think in terms of what is the target? What is their purpose? Suppose they are used in war. For what kind of target would they be directed? Of course, we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, whole cities were the targets. And that was in World War II. And if you wanted to bomb a bomb bearing factory in Town X, you bombed Town X because your bombs were not accurate. You had to get, you had to try to destroy a region. Nowadays, it's totally different. Nowadays, we can have pinpoint accuracy. Think of the recent attack in you know, the Libyan airfield. 
from hundreds of miles away, we launched cruise missiles, we found that target and so accurately that it could destroy aircraft on the ground without destroying the runway. Why have atomic, why have nuclear weapons if you can do that? You don't need them. They far, they're far too big. The targets are too small, the weapons are too big, especially either way. So I, when I, I saw in the New York Times an editorial suggesting that we don't need a small number of nuclear weapons for deterrence and a small number for possible use in war, I reacted by writing this letter. I will turn around and face you and re read it for a piece of paper. You, that is the New York Times, say that the only legitimate role for nuclear weapons is deterrence and that we have enough advanced conventional weapons to defend against most threats. I suggest instead that there is no legitimate role for nuclear weapons and that we have enough conventional weapons to defend against all threats. Targets in any future conflict are not cities or large areas. They are small and can reach with pinpoint accuracy. There is simply no rationale for the use of nuclear weapons, even in response to a nuclear attack. The, the, uh, the correct number of nuclear weapons in the world, as President Barack Obama and other world leaders have recognized, is zero. I thank you for time enough for your time. I thank you for your attention. And now. <laughs> Gary asked me just to add a few words about whether uh, we, when we were designing the first H bomb, whether we are aware of the hazards of radiation. The answer is yes, in the sense that physicists already knew uh, of the dangers of radiation and what exposure could produce, but we were, we were not really yet concerned with the effect on populations. The, the, fir the, nu the first the, uh, nuclear, the first, the first international treaty the banned above ground testing was in 1963. So by that time, there was a concern about radioactive fallout. But from 45 to 63, um, tests were conducted in the atmosphere with no concern. I, I compare it to pouring rat poison in the ocean. Rat poison is bad. You don't want anybody to get near it or swim close to it. But if you put it in the ocean, it's okay. It is so diluted that it ceases to be a problem. That's the attitude that, that, that uh, the leaders had about radiation in those early days, that it was so diluted as it spread around the world, it did not represent a significant hazard. So does that answer this? <laughs> in, in two sentences, how do you make an h <laughs> Well, fission involves a, a uranium or plutonium, which, which when bombarded by a neutron, undergoes fission and releases energy. You're breaking up a heavy nucleus into a small nucleus with the release of nuclear energy. Fusion occurs when you combine light nuclei to slightly heavier nucleus, such as combining helium to make hydrogen, uh, sorry, the other way around. Combining hydrogen to make helium, that's what happens in the sun, and that's basically what happens in a thermonuclear weapon. So in very different concepts between fusing light elements or fissioning large elements. But to make it happen on Earth, you have to get those light elements, the hydrogen or deuterium, up to an exceedingly high temperature. That means tens of millions of degrees. And that's the challenge. How do you do it? And using a nuclear weapon, fission weapon as a trigger is the answer to that question. You, you, uh, there are many details. <laughs> won't try to go into now, but, but that's the basic idea that the fission bomb provides the energy to provide the temperature, and the temperature provides the mechanism for the thermonuclear reactions to occur. Ken, uh, what's this? Tell them, please. Uh, this is, oh yes, what you're, what you're delineating with a red marker is, is Mike. That's the first uh, hydrogen bomb. All of the, the little uh, things coming out, of it, the, the tubes coming out of it to the right side uh, are for diagnostics. So this is an experiment in which in the microseconds available for making measurements, uh, neutrons, uh, gamma rays, other particles coming out of the explosion went through those tubes to, to detectors that were mounted nearby. 
Right. And how much did it weigh? And we dropped it from a plane? No, this was too big to drop. This was a, the first test was not a, not a weapon as such. It was a thermonuclear test. And uh, deliverable weapons that could be loaded on a, a bomber came about two years later. Okay, next we have um, Hank Baldwin. Hank, um, this is interesting. He went to a VA hospital and near New Haven, where he lives, Connecticut, and he went in to see a VA doctor, as I just said, and I think it was within the last three years, and he said, I'm an atomic veteran to the VA doctor. What? The doctor admitted he didn't know hardly anything about atomic veterans. He said, look, Hank, Mr. Bolton, I'm going to do some research on this, and I will get back to you. Come and see me, what, two weeks later? So he came back two weeks later. I can't believe this. The doctor says, I did some research. Here is a person's name. Contact him. Moi, me. He found me on the internet somewhere, Facebook, with pictures maybe at the post office, I don't know. <laughs> and so I, I was contacted by, by Hank, and we've been telephone friends for a while, and I've been trying to help him too. So enough of that. I want to introduce a great friend and another hero. Hero. And his wife, Cynthia, is next to him. Take it away. Well, this is without, without uh, any notes, so I'm talking off the top of my head. It is indeed a pleasure to meet uh, Kenneth here. I'm the victim, the guinea pig, <laughs> that's meeting the designer. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, it says that I'm 81 years old, but I'm actually 80 years old. <laughs> yeah. The reason being is that I, uh, I joined the Army at the age of 16. I was pretty smart and out of school already. And so I forged my birth certificate, joined the service, not knowing what I was getting into because it was the tail end of the Korean War. You know, I didn't even know what war was about. It was like Boy Scouts, you know, you know I, I thought. You know, so anyhow, uh, one of my missions uh, in 1955, I was shipped to Nevada, February 18, 1955, to be a participant in a uh, nuclear, nuclear testing. Uh, not knowing that uh, there would be any harm from being a participant, not knowing what uh, the duties would be, you know, so when your commanding officer told you to jump, you jump. You ask no questions. And there were stories where uh, the reason for doing these particular tests was they had, they had weaponry out in the field. Uh, and they first started out using mannequins and uh, dummies and, and, uh, and, and houses built with just a facade houses to do testing. And they could not get the results that they really wanted from using other than live things. So they decided that at this time it would be, be best to use live individuals, guinea pigs, so to speak. There were people who haven't been exposed to radiation who, and when the bomb went off, they could put their hands over their eyes and, and, and actually see the bones in the hand. There were those who uh, had flesh just, just ripped off their bodies, you know. Uh, fortunately, I was in, the, in a foxhole and the bomb went off and all I remember feeling was the heat from the, from the blast and, and the dust. 
and thereafter you were told to uh, get out the foxhole and march toward ground zero. Ground zero being, of course, where the actual explosion actually happened. I didn't have to do that because the ground was proved to be too hot, so we didn't have to do that. Returning to our barracks, the only cleanup that we had was each soldier taking a broom and brushing one another off with a broom. Not really uh, the way to do it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the illnesses that, that I particularly get, uh, get out of uh, being exposed to radiation uh, are uh, multiple myeloma, which is un uncurable, incurable, uh, bladder cancer, uh, post-subcapsular cataracts, we're looking at the, 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 the light of the bomb exploding, exploding and uh, non-malignant thyroid disease. It's not something that uh, anyone really wants to have as a part of their life. You know, so I'm just thankful to, to still be here. In 1991, I was really diagnosed with, uh, with multiple myeloma. I was given three and a half to four years to live. So by 1995, I was supposed to have been dead, so I'm 26 years past that. And that's thanks to divine intervention, and not my doing. So I'm just happy to have you folks out here to, uh, to, to uh, attest to this moment with us and my fellow atomic veterans. Thank you. I guess I can't back up on this. I've got to go through the beginning. Oh, there you are. My um, next good friend I've known for two years, I went to his home in Plainfield, Massachusetts, not too far from here, and I put him on camera. <clears throat> And his wife, Anne, is here. And we've stayed in touch, guys. I've made personal friends out of all of these atomic veterans. Do you, are you supposed to do that, making a documentary? No, I don't give a flying, you know, you know what, you know where, too. Um, Ed uh, is a former Marine. He will tell you her, his horrific story. And not to talk too much, but I never do that, right? He has two daughters, one of which is here tonight. They're in their mid-50s. And I talk too much. Between them, there's been several, several miscarriages producing children and grandchildren. So I, I want to introduce another great friend and another hero like Hank and Dr. Ford, Dr. Ken. Ed, take it away. Thank you. I'm out of water. Well, good evening. It's good to be here in the company of these fine people and, and all of you. In 1951, I was drafted August of 1951 in Chicago. And when I got to the draft board, I discovered that that was the first day that 20% of the class was destined to be selected for the Marine Corps. I was not selected, but I held up my hand. I said, if any of these guys don't make it, count on me. And I was able to get in at that time, and I've been proud of every minute ever since. Uh, 
in the Marines as well as in the Army were all riflemen. Uh, we had a process of selecting what was called a secondary MOS from a long list. 5711, Chemical, Biological, Radiological Warfare Specialist. I opted. So I'm the second expert up here, except I did my expertise training in three days. <laughs> and as a result of that, when the first troop movement exercises through ground zeros were conducted, uh, 1,800 Marines from across the country, from uh, Pendleton and from Lejeune, uh, were collected, and we were there. And on the 2nd of May, 1952, I thought I'd share with you some words. Let me tell you, I put these words together 15 years later, when I was a Toastmaster of my place of employment, the Smithsonian. And when I reread these expressions, as vivid as they were then for, for me then, they still are as vivid. And I want to share. Pre-dawn, on a day in 1952, I knelt in the blackness of a five-foot-deep trench, while overhead in the far distance was the trail of a bomber that had actually dropped the A-bomb the size of the Hiroshima blast. And just a pearl-white strip up there. We uh, were guided in terms of the process, and the process was very simple. To face down backs against the front of the, of the trench, follow the countdown carefully. The voice spoke out over a, a, a ring of, of, of speakers for us, 45 seconds. 40, 35, and 1,000 other of us uh, faced downward in the darkness. And suddenly, there was no time involved. Time stopped. Now, assembled as we were with the countdown, As the count proceeded, I'll tell you what. Let me share with you the event itself. When the A-bomb ex landed, exploded 1,000 feet up, the flash of white light was like a great torrent of whitewash or white paint. We're facing down in the darkness. We are covered by a white bath that took all images away. You couldn't discern your feet or any other characteristics from that flash, which I can feel it now again. And then we had the, the method of turning, putting our backs on the rear wall to take the, the shock wave that came out. And after that, turning with placing our, our backs against the front wall and very carefully counting to 10 at the minimum before lifting up and turning and looking out. Earlier than that, we would have been blinded. When we looked out, you can't see it from where you are, but you may look at it later on, come and look. Here's a photograph of the A-bomb that I witnessed with my other uh, Marine vets 
back then. I'm the guy on the left up in front here. And my, my task, the three days of tra training, were how to read a meter uh, and do radiation count. And in the walkthrough, we had a march through to Ground Zero plan. Uh, several of us had monitors, and each of us led our, our unit. Uh, it was to have been about six, 1,800 meters. At, six, at about 650 meters, uh, my meter registered all the way off. Two or three others of the several of us that were doing this, leading our, our units, had the same experience. Our commanding officer held up. The AEC sent over two of their uh, technicians dressed in white suits, like a, a, an ad for a, a loaf of bread, if you will, totally and completely covered. By the way, we, we were protected behind a two inch by, by four inch badge uh, on our chest. That was the, our degree of protection. Now, I'd like to move forward from the immediate event to the aftermath. And you see, each of us had our own experience. Each of us carried our own capabilities. Uh, eight months after the atomic energy event, the, the shot called Shot, shot Dog, uh, I was uh, injured in a landing exercise at Camp Pendleton and had a hard fall of some 35 feet and wound up uh, uh, with damage to two, two spinal uh, discs, four, five, and five S1. Th that damage continued to, to progress, uh, but I was able to get patched up enough in order to to, uh, to proceed. Now, um, but in the aftermath of that spinal damage, uh, we had, uh, I was able to make my way through my service term, but <laughs> the effects of that continued and the numbers of operations that were required continued. I've now had uh, what's called a wide laminectomy. That's an opening on the back of the spine to take the processes out because without that, the spinal cord itself would have been compressed and I would have been at, at, at best uh, a quad. So I have right now opened uh, arenas in the back of my spine at eight levels, five cervical, and three lumbar. And the reason for that requirement came from the growth of bone tissue inside the spinal canal. The bone tissue derived in all likelihood, you can only prove it by going through a process which is not available, but from all likelihood from the strontium-90 effects. It produces bone. And how many of us are vict were victimized by that and carried those damages forward, who knows? You know, uh, we were team, team members all, but the sense of team went beyond just those of us in the military. Remember in the early 50s, World War II was a great team event for the whole country. We felt the unity of, of, of our purpose rather than evaluating the immediate effects and projecting what those effects uh, might, might be. But we've been, still need to learn that there are other effects than just the effects on the body. 
we were blessed. I, but my lovely wife and, and and I met in 1960 at a Stevenson for President Club meeting. Okay. And in 1963, my our lovely daughter Lisa was with us. In 1965, Rachel, dear Rachel. Now, Rachel and Lisa, in their marriages, made efforts to produce a child. Several, a number of times. Rachel in particular, a number of times, without success. Here is a factor. Uh, with the two kids, and we love to camp, we thought, hey, four is a nice number. Why don't we settle at four? So I went to the, the clinic uh, to have uh, the cords tied, and the process of uh, doing that is, is initiated. Before that, one takes a sperm sample to put it in the bank. When the sample was made, it turned out my fertility was zero. So that means that in the years following the 1952 event, the slow erosion had its effect. Thank heavens there was enough left over so that we were blessed with, with two beautiful, beautiful girls and, and families. But the reality is this, no growth beyond them. The, the numbers of victims of atomic experience, warfare, exercises, is more than just the, those of us who are wounded directly and carry. Maybe the, the, the greater number are the people who never happened, who are not on this earth, because of the effects of, of the atomic uh, events and damage. And let us be mindful of that as we look at the overall costs of the work. We're all sensitive today. We we're all team members then. We are still all team members. And let our, our mission be to carry this forward. Thank you. I'm going to hire him to uh, do my talking too, maybe. Um, before we do questions, we all are going to do, we're all going to do a um, little circle here for 30 seconds. Everybody? Here we all are, scientists and the atomic veterans, and me from Congress. Here we are. Thank you. The group hug, I guess. That was my idea. Can you imagine? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Come on. Hey. Uh... I'm also on the top of the ladder. Did I talk to you earlier? Yeah. Okay, um, at the end, give me your information. Uh, I want to put you on camera, probably. Not tonight. Um, where do you live? New York. Sit. Okay, where? All right. Okay. Okay, see me a little later, please. Um, try to get a hold of me. I got other people who are going to be grabbing me. Terry, we have a, a special guest here tonight. I did not know what's coming, and I'm very happy. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Terry Hammer. I'm with the National Association of Atomic Veterans. I'm Assistant Commander for North Carolina. Um, I can take you uh, forward in time. Uh, 
that hydrogen bomb was uh, blown up one of the uh, islands in the Anahuac Hole. Excuse me, would you like oh. to come up here? Oh, sure, sure. I thought I was big and loud enough anyway. Right. Uh, as I was saying, that uh, weapon that was used, uh, the hydrogen bomb, actually vaporized one of the islands of Anahuac Atoll. But we had, a, we had a treaty with the Marshallese people who we had evicted from the island to uh, do the hydrogen bomb test and 47 other bomb tests. So we had to give them the islands back. So in 1977, they got the bright idea of sending around 4,000 people to go scrape up the soil and the buildings and a little bit of everything else, a little leftover stuff from Vietnam, a little beryllium, a little of this and a little of that, chuck it all into one of the craters that were made by one of the atomic bombs. and cover that up with 18 whole inches of concrete. You can actually see it on Google Earth where the vines are now growing over that entombment. So, I wanna ask our scientists here, how smart was that? <laughs> Not smart. <laughs> So, in, in the same fights that Gary was talking about for the original veterans who were exposed to that radiation is going on again for these veterans so that we sent out to, to Anahuitak Atoll to run graders in cut-off fatigues. That's what they wore, not, not the big banana suit, not the white radiation suit, none of that. Because number one, it's 115 degrees in the shade there. And, and really interesting place. But so they were exposed not only to the radiation, they were exposed to certain chemicals. And they couldn't talk about it until 1996 to anyone. And now we're having the fight with the VA, which requires a code, a, a change to Title 38 to include the Anuitak Atoll veterans. So if you want to call Bernie Sanders or anybody else, your, your congressman, to support that cause, I'd appreciate it. And thank you very much for a few minutes. Thank you. Um, I've been working with Senator Leahy's office, or they've been working with me. And if any of you need help, atomic veterans, even if you're not from Vermont, you uh, can get help through Senator Leahy and Senator Sanders. And they all gave their greetings tonight and Congressman Welch. I forgot to mention one thing, in 1996, President Clinton and his Secretary of Defense, William Perry, did a directive saying now these atomic veterans could talk mainly to the VA about their experiences and not be labeled traitors in order to uh, obtain health care. But there was a little premise there, if that's what it is, it said, you can't talk to any other governments about this. Okay, questions. Um, uh, let's wait here first. Were there any high-ranking officers? With, and how many? There were low-ranking officers. Uh, first, um, well, we were a provisional battalion, so the the line officer structure was typical of of a unit uh, prepared for exercise, whether. Whether combat or, or in, in training or preparation. But as for higher ranks, uh, I cannot tell you that. Uh, we were, I was a, I mean, a sergeant in the 3rd Marine Brigade, which is known as uh, Chester Puller's uh, Brigade. We were training in replacement command. The, the command uh, individuals were not with us, but we had. Uh, probably, uh, uh, certainly, uh, a major and more colonel uh, 
metals in just what would be conventional rather than unusual. Hank, do you remember? Yeah, the conventional way would be that they would always do some office involved. Speak up. Speak up. Do you mind coming they, up they here? They would always do some office involved, but they wouldn't be in the trenches. They'd be well protected. They would be well protected, you know. You know so uh, as long as the troops are really exposed. So uh, certainly, as I said before, there they certainly wouldn't be officers around. That's, that's the conventional way of doing the military. How about you, Mr. Scientist? I want to comment, I have one friend, a fellow physicist in the Leeds, who did witness a close-up a nuclear test in Nevada. I never had that privilege, if you would call it that. It was, it was so, it, such a, an incredible experience in his life. He's written about it several times. It's appeared in the book he's written. But his feeling is strongly, if, if everybody on Earth could just witness, not necessarily be damaged by it, but witness, a nuclear explosion, we would have a different attitude toward the whole business. Um, thank you. Uh, next question, let's, okay. Uh, yeah, I get, we got a lot of questions. Anyone that has to go and you have a question, raise your hand now so I'll know where you are. Okay, my name is John Larney and I'm from Lake, Lake Bamzine, Vermont. And um, I was in the same islands as Terry. And I worked there from February to July of 1979, cleaning these islands up. We all did six month duty there. That's what our tour of duty was, TDY. We went from our bases all over the country. They didn't put everybody, like three guys from one base, they separated us, that was the plan. They didn't want us to know each other once we left there. It doesn't get talked about much, but it's true. And for the, la for the last three years, I've been contacting my um, senators and everything, and just, just so they will say, yes, you were in those islands working. I have pictures of me there. I have pictures of this crater that we filled in. <laughs> I was a I was a E5 sergeant at the time in charge of 10 men every day in and out of those islands. And I have this certificate that I um, submitted to eligibility at the VA and it keeps coming back. No good. So I'm gonna read it real quick. For outstanding performance of duty under arduous conditions while participating in the Anahuita cleanup operation, the Anahuita Catal, Marshall Islands. This three-year project consisted of restoring the atoll to the people of Inuitak by removing debris, plutonium, contaminated soil, and structures which pose radiation or other hazards to human habitation. During this period, you gave outstanding support and maximum effort with, which greatly facilitated the smooth functions of this many-faceted operation. Your dedication to duty, outstanding technical competence, and professional attitude contributed immeasurably to the successful completion of this very important and vital mission and reflected great credit upon the Corps of Engineers and the United States Army. And it's signed by a Lieutenant Colonel who is also on our Facebook page, which we've had for eight years. In eight years, we have found 566 of the men surviving. We have an obituary page that grows more and more every month. And, and like one of the gentlemen said, some of these men came home from Anwitak and within nine months they had children. Some of these children are dying in the last few years of cancers. And birth defects too. Right, exactly. All the same stuff. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It's dated 1979. That was the year I went on the committee. 79. Uh, the lady. <laughs> right. um, first of all, the atomic veterans. This is the first time we've ever heard about you fellows. This wasn't anything that was taught in school. 
No way. We had no idea that you folks even existed. A simple thank you is not enough for what you did for this country. You have not been treated right. Now, to the ladies, did you notice a difference in your father, your husbands, after they had come home from these exposures to the radiation? Did you see any difference? Physically or mentally? Well, Ed and I were um, married after he had had that experience, which was in the early 50s, and we were married in the early 60s. So um, certainly as, as we've grown older, his spinal condition has gotten worse and worse, and um, it's hard to live with the constant pain. And he's been incredible because he tries to stay as active as he can. Um, his orthopod, uh, who is not with the VA, uh, you know, he, he says to him, he's saying, the more you can be active, you know, that's the best thing you can do. But, you know, it's very difficult to deal with someone who's in pain all the time. And uh, it's, it's not easy for him, and, but he works at it all the time. Mary Chandler, do you have a question? I'd like to have a question from you. For any one of us. Yes, sir, you. Do you have a question on anything that was brought up? All right, All right. hands, someone, come on, please. Yes, sir, back there. Speak up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my question is for um, Mr. Bolton over there. When they sent you out, what was the rationale given behind your orders? Did they just tell you that you had to be at a certain place at a certain time? When they, when they sent you out, did you have to be at a certain place or a certain time? Yeah. Um, if I could just report. When they sent you out, did they give any sort of rationale for what you were doing in your orders, or were your orders just to go to a certain place at a certain time? Exactly, yeah. Be at, a, be at a certain place at a certain time. Uh, there, there was no indication as to what we were supposed to do when, when we got there. We had no idea. We, no one knew that we were going to be part of a, a nuclear test. You know, it was, it was called voluntary involuntary. The military has a way of Hank also told me, um, well, I know this in Congress that um, when they would, they would uh, pick these people <laughs> to volunteer, did you hear me pick these people? Um, they would go to different battalions, different companies, so they didn't know each other. And also, um, Hank, you told me this, so I can say this and feel free. Um, you were segregated in another area with other, okay. Yeah, how do you like that? And that was after President Truman's declaration of 19, help me, 53, about our armed forces. Okay, next question. Move along. Yes, ma'am. Um, Gary, you're in the middle of the documentary right now. You're not finished. It, no, no. Right, thank you. Great question. I need more of these atomic veterans to interview. The question is, how far along am I in the uh, documentary? I need more. I only have six or seven or eight. I need more atomic veterans to put on camera. And one of the wives said to me, Ann over here, hurry up. These guys are going. So you know what that did to me? Uh, put a fire under my, you know what? I think we have an atomic veteran over here. Yes. Roland? Follow up on John Army. Uh, it took me years to get my papers stating that I was in Johnson Island, 1962. Johnson Island, which is right near the end of the atmospheric. And then Dominic 1 and 2. Testing. Uh, it took me years to get my paper. Well, once I got my paper, put my claim, and then you come back and say, well, yeah. you gotta, you got to let us know what your REN badges were reading and where you're at. Well, fire in St. Louis back in the 
late 70s, early 80s, burned up all of them for what they did. They sent me an estimate of what my rent was, which was lower than what, what it would be. So, yeah. uh, and, uh, one other quick thing with, with that, I was 18 years old when I went to Johnson Island. I weren't supposed to be in those tests because in my age, I was supposed to, uh, I couldn't absorb or be involved in a certain megaton of uh, atomic blast. So uh, they couldn't fly me off because I was on a destroyer. They couldn't fly me off. So what they told me, you go down to Mestax, lay down, cover your head up with your hands, and you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's incredible. And I, I believe, I'm extremely tired, but I, I believe Hank also said to us that, um, uh, your records were burnt in that infamous, famous fire in 1973, St. Louis, Missouri, and the VA is trying to say, um, well, your records are burnt, we can't prove you're an atomic veteran. However, there's hardly anything in those bloody records showing he's an atomic veteran. That's what the government government did. Did you mention the lie detector test? Yeah, we did. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, you want me to do it or what? Um, Hank, four months ago, this should have national news. Well, I try. He's having a hard time with the VA proving he's an atomic veteran because of records that were kept and were not kept. He went out and paid for his own lie detector test. There you go. And he passed. He sent this to me. He passed his own lie detector test with. Um, uh, independent from the VA, thank God. So he has this proof. So I'm trying to get him national coverage for well, all of them, somehow. Can you imagine that? So um, thank you. Another question, please? How about we take one more question? This is the one. Um, OK, do we have, I want to get one more person. Um, ask the women, ask uh, Rachel. One more quick question. All right, what's your question? You can do it from there. Um, I will. Um, to contact our group, and you'll find out so much stuff about all of this, everything about this. We have, we have tens of thousands of things to look at, videos, we have everything you can imagine. We have Morley Saper on the island doing a long video. He walked right by me, kept in his crew, 60 minutes doing a video. And if you go to Anna We Talk Cleanup Veterans, so all you got to type in, and you'll have our whole page. And if you want to join the page, you're welcome, because we want everybody on there. But you'd be amazed at what you see. Everybody on there has pictures, and everybody's pictures keep coinciding with one another right through the three years we were there. It's a, it's a great site to go on. Okay, thank you. And one last item is, again, if any of you knows where an atomic veteran is, I want to interview them, you can contact me through the library or just go on Facebook or Google me. There's a lot. Thank you so much for coming. Yes.